let's bounce the ball and get going. We've got David Pledger, who's going to lead us into a consideration of the interoperability of the arts and, and climate change. So just a, a sort of minor side issue that David's picking up on here. <laughs> Floor's yours, David. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, thanks, everybody. Nice to be here with you. Um, I am uh, I'm here on the, uh, the lands of the Bunurong people um, of the Kulin Nation. And uh, I say that also with a, uh, just the note that there's been a, a reassignment of the lands of the Kulin Nation. Uh, and um, uh, where some of us were Bunurong, we're now either Wurundjeri or Bunurong. Um, I, so, look, I'm going to be quite honest with you here because I'm, I'm not, uh, what I've, what I'm trying to do is play out an idea. So I'm, I'm not well prepared. It's not well balanced, but I might actually hit some notes along the way, which might be of use to everybody. Um, I, I've been working a lot around the idea of, um, uh, what I call concentric circles of dramaturgy. So my project, uh, uh, my sort of uh, one of my sort of one of my practice concerns that I've sort of written about um, most recently in a longer essay is around the relationship of artistic dramaturgy to cultural dramaturgy to the dramaturgy of society and dramaturgy in the way that I unpack it is around uh, operating systems. To talk about the operating systems of artistic production of cultural production and of a, of a society. So I've always been interested in the kind of interconnectedness of things. Um, and uh, at the moment I'm working in a kind of uh, multidisciplinary space, curating a program around art, science and technology. And I think one of the reasons I've sort of come to this is partly because I've often been quite nervous around the way in which the arts has been instrumentalized. Uh, in um, broader spaces. And then I felt like if one might get on the front foot as an artist, one might actually occupy some space. Um, so it, with that framing, in the last sort of 10 to 12 years, I've been working in the space of art and climate change really intermittently at first, and uh, really over the last four to five years, much more habitually. And I've done that in kind of policy settings, in art making and curatorial spaces. And I've noticed, uh, and I've noted that in that time that those working in the arts and in the environmental sectors have quite a lot in common. Uh, and really, if, I, if I'm talking about environmental sectors, and I really don't have my language here, so please forgive me. Um, I'm sort of talking about those working in the conservation and the protection of the natural world, if you like. Um, so that's, an, that's probably a space of activism, but also it's a space of science as well. And I'd just like to mention a few sort of shared items, really, that I, that, that I think the two sectors uh, uh, um, kind of uh, have in common. So I think the first one uh, is that the economic benefits of the arts and renewable energy are irrelevant to right-wing governments. Uh, the ideological imperative of neoliberalism is essentially to disable democracy um, and that uh, it determines right-wing governments to ignore both sectors' economic arguments and refuse the distribution of public monies to the arts and renewable energies, despite the rousing econometrics from both sectors. Um, it's probably uh, hard for many people who've kind of developed that those statistics in the in um, in the arts to see it dismissed so brutally by um, government, um, and I think it's been clear pretty much from the get-go in climate change space. But for the arts, I think last year was pretty much okay. It doesn't matter how much you know you know GDP percentage you bring in. Um, we really don't we really don't care. Um, and uh, last year when the majority of artists and arts workers were excised from JobKeeper and the Academy also, um, which often provides a secondary income for many artists and arts workers, it was really a kind of, it was a definitive full stop, which you know, I think is not a bad thing because it, it just gives clarity. 
the second um, sort of shared um, uh, shared item uh, is public perception and or the perception of public perception. And it was brought up a little bit late in the conversation before around the media. The arts and climate change are reportedly on the nose with the majority of the Australian public. With climate change, that's pretty much, I think that's quite true. It's a direct consequence of the politicisation of the issue over the last 15 years. Um, uh, although I think that's probably been mitigated somewhat by the uh, student um, uh, activist generation who do neither remember nor give credence to that politicisation process. And their pushback and resistance has been inspirational. I think with regard to the negative perception of the arts, it does seem largely driven by conservative media, and that was uh, mentioned earlier. And their efforts have, I think, have successfully turned that perception into a reality. I think there is um, a negative perception of the arts. However, I would say that's probably a, a view that's widely shared more in the arts than outside the arts. And I think that's problematic. I, I inhabit quite a lot of spaces outside the arts and I find often a much more generous view of the arts than that propounded within the arts. The view from within is generally communicated, I think, by bureaucrats and advocacy agents whose experience of their own failures and deficits uh, tend to be projected onto the arts ecology. I don't necessarily think that is representative of a wider public. Um, a third uh, uh, a third kind of shared item is this, uh, is, is, the whole idea of extinction. There's many threatened species in the natural world face extinction. World biodiversity has declined, you know, in half a century alarmingly, more than 25,000 species. Um, almost a third of those that are known are actually in danger of disappearing and climate change will be responsible for 8% of these. In the ecology of the arts, I think that the, artists is, the artist is similarly threatened. The anecdotal evidence of the last uh, 18 months suggests this sort of a generation defining exodus. But I would say that before that, the kind of attrition of neoliberalism has seen artist populations flatline for some time. And I think that's uh, represented in the evidence. And I think that this attrition lies in neoliberalism's evolution from an ideology to an interface. So the consequence of this has basically fundamentally altered the DNA of the arts as primary producers, the artists. And, and Justin Clements wrote a really interesting essay, I think for Arena last year, and he was sort of channeling uh, an interesting uh, Cameroonian philosopher, Akile Mbembe. And, and he, he quotes, this is a really, really interesting quote. He says, there are no longer artists as such, only creative industry entrepreneurs not different in kind, but only in scale from any other entrepreneur, whether it's a local bottle shop spruiking its t-shirts from its website or Elon Musk heading for Mars. No inside to art anymore, nor any outside, just precarious hustling for business at the limits of capital's systemic viability. And I think that really encapsulates really well how many artists feel compelled to operate and behave and to talk about what they do. And it reflects the reduction of art to cultural product and commodity. There are a number of other kind of, you know, uh, uh, shared items between the arts and the kind of climate change uh, sector. Um, and I think the, the Justin's talk before sort of raised a number of those around human rights. And also I think there's an issue around public good, but I don't want to go into that. So, they do, have, they do have things in common, um, and which means that they are, they are, or they can be interoperable. And what I mean by that, it means they can, they can share and make use of information. So actually there's enormous amount of potential for us to understand better what it, how it is we do uh, what we do, how we can advocate for the languages that we can kind of develop Unfortunately, historically, this, this kind of interoperability hasn't been the case until quite recently. And I'd like to unpack a little bit of why that is in regard to Australian conditions. So I'm gonna kind of zoom out a little bit and talk about um, 
what happened last year in 2020 when Rio Tinto basically destroyed the two rock shelters in the Jukan Gorge, which are Aboriginal cultural sites uh, of over 46,000 years of age. So Rio Tinto's action was undertaken with the full knowledge of the site's cultural value and within the legal framework governing its activities. So in its public communications, there was no sense that Rio Tinto was considered to have done anything wrong according to its, the, the guiding principles of its, of, uh, of its corporate governance. Its main regret was confined to the global public outcry to these actions. So in this civilizational perspective that frames Rio Tinto's activities, nature and culture exist only as resources. There's no countenance of a society in which culture and nature are interchangeable. The Rio Tinto is simply not equipped to behave in the world in a way that can save it from the impending disasters of its own creation. It has no moral or ethical power or imperative to halt its momentum, in fact, quite the opposite. And for decades, companies like Rio Tinto have been key players in the production and promulgation of the arts in Australia, which directly implicates the arts in the values and operations of extractive capitalism. You can see this through board representation, event sponsorship, partnership arrangements, Australian arts agencies, how they behave, arts training and tertiary institutions, major cultural institutions and presenting organisations. They all have these relationships and they are and they are therefore complicit in the practices and the values behind these practices. There's a brilliant piece of work by um, uh, Gabriella de Vietri, uh, who's a visual artist, uh, called Maps of Gratitude, Cones of Silence and Lumps of Coal. And she really kind of charts this nexus of complicity, which implicates the arts in the cultural ambience of corporate Australia's malfeasance in extractive capitalism. It's a narrative that's becoming more explicit in our cultural discourse. And you'll know the probably the most recent case is Outrage, um, which uh, had its Fringe World uh, Festival earlier this year. It's sponsored directly by Woodside. Um, and they, they put in their artists' agreements the following clause, which bound artists to, and this is a quote, to use their best endeavours to not do any act or omit to do any act that would prejudice any of Fringe World's sponsorship arrangements. So that, that's, we, we call that, um, the shorthand for that, there's a beautiful word, it's called censorship. So the continuation of this sponsorship was recently announced. So they, they didn't learn from the protests, they simply ignored them. So there's a really great, uh, there's an interesting artist and activist called Oliver Krug, who's, uh, work, who's out, out of, works out of Britain. And he has this very interesting quote. For decades, arts institutions have effectively engaged in self-censorship to pay for their productions, putting on amazing program and covering critical topics as long as it wasn't a thorough debate of our addiction to fossil fuels. This strategic exclusion of a topic from public debate over more than a generation has led to ignorance with repercussions in education, academic and public life. And it's a status quo that's had a direct bearing on support for Australian artists who until the last few years and with few exceptions have struggled to consistently generate a body, a body of work around human made changes to climate. So what, what we, what we have at the moment is uh, the inscription of the values of extractive, extract, of extractive capitalism in Australia's major cultural institutions, which problematizes the creation of work that is hostile to the operation of that industry. So basically, if you are critiquing, um, uh, if you're critiquing the NGV and its sponsorship relationships, if that was part of your project, you wouldn't get a look in. If you were critiquing the way in which um, Black Swan uh, you know, uh, has been appropriated by the Forrest family. You won't get a look in, you're, you're sidelined. It happens quietly in a very sophisticated and fluent way. It's very dangerous. However, there's really been a lot more um, 
so this sort of resistance to art that challenges these values, um, it's actually propagated by agencies, the funding agencies. So in the last kind of change to a major performing arts organisations, the federal funding framework basically said to major performing arts organisations, all right, if you want your support, um, it's got to be conditional attending to issues of diversity and First Nations engagement. Matters of climate change in both operation and programming were completely exempt, exempt from these conditions and the cultural ambience of supervision by the extractive capitalism industry persists. Despite the best efforts of many artists and not cultural operators, including myself, the Australia Council has absolutely refused to adopt policy that centres environmental sustainability. That really, that kind of responsibility and that task has been taken up by um, the small to medium and independent sector. Um, many of which have attempted to create art and abide by values and develop policy that acknowledge these critical conditions. Um, and there's been, you know, a number of situations unlike Outrage where actually all, all small organisations said, we don't want to be, uh, we don't want to get funded with that money. And they've been, it's a, it's a very nuanced argument because you are going to get people that say, we, we will take the money and others that won't. So I really want to make sure that I'm not making a judgment call on it. I'm saying this is a problem that needs to be unpacked. There's also been interesting kind of um, attempts at fairly proactive programming through organisations like Climart, Tipping Point and Green Music Australia, which, you know, at a later date, we can talk about at length. There is one program that I want to just kind of land with you that um, uh, to kind of come uh, as I move my way back into this idea of interoperability. Um, and I've been doing some work um, uh, uh, on the Refuge program, which is a five year artistic inquiry into the relationship between the arts, climate change and community that has been produced and presented by Melbourne's Arts House. And so I'll declare my interest here. I'm the lead author of the Reef Refuge publication project, which has been commissioned by Arts House and the Research Unit of Public Cultures at Melbourne Uni. So I just want to talk a little bit um, uh, as I finish up about Refuge. It's a kind of an interesting program. Honestly, when it came onto my uh, radar, I sort of thought, oh, you've got to be kidding me. Why would you be bothering about that? That's just like, is that ever going to happen? And that kind of nexus, it doesn't work. They did, they did, um, you know, they did floods, they did, uh, you know, fires, they did pandemic. And every year they went through it, you could kind of go, well, oh, that looks a bit more familiar, or that looks a bit more likely. I start to feel that in my blood when I look at that program. Uh, it was one of the most, it is one of the most prescient uh, arts um, propositions to have been conceived in Australia. One of the most interesting things about it is that, it, you know, we often we have um, one-off one projects or annual events or, or, you know, we look at programs that are, have a practice that's defined by a specific artist. This is not like that. Um, it's really a kind of a, a sustained commitment uh, to an artistic inquiry. So it's not actually about uh, developing or producing outcomes or product. It's, it's actually about a methodology. And that's why it's very interesting when we start framing it around notions of dramaturgy. Five-year program, uh, kinds of things that are much more usual in European houses and platforms. We get a, a, a lots of ongoing national funding. Um, I think they did benefit, and this is a very interesting kind of key for us to be thinking about. That Arts House is uh, a program of the city of Melbourne even though it operates in a kind of atmosphere of institutional precarity, it does have a fair amount of security around its funding. Uh, and I think they kind of realised that early on, that perhaps it's you know, true that a program like that could only be sustained through support and buy-in from local government authority. And that's probably in the broader context of local government authorities around Australia um, acknowledging a climate emergency. And you can probably see this program in Melbourne in relation to... Um, the city of Yarra's recent initiative to, to bring a climate artist in residence. And uh, that's unsurprising given that the mayor of the city of Yarra is the um, artist formerly known as Gabriella de Vietri, who made that incredible uh, uh, artwork around the, uh, the influences of the extractive capitalists on the arts and cultural sector. I just want to return to this idea of interoperability. Um, so, it's such an interesting kind of space in, in the, um, you know, in, uh, uh, in this 
kind of emergency services space. So that basically there's artists, there's local community, and there's emergency services uh, officers and operations. And one of, the, um, one of the interesting parts about it is that there's the, the, the way in which the, the, the information gets shared, I think, is because some of the principles that you're operating on are familiar from one sector to the next. And this was really too in the kind of, um, in the practice area of simulation and rehearsal. Um, and I don't know if uh, many of you people uh, know of Faye Bendrups. Do, you, do you, any, some of you might in Melbourne, Faye Bendrups is a performer, a theatre and an academic. She sort of worked out of Melbourne, Melbourne Theatre Company. Uh, Faye is actually the um, vice president of the uh, SES in Victoria, uh, which is a volunteering agency. Um, and she's the head of the Footscray, Footscray unit of the SES. Um, and she was introduced to the Arts House team through City of Melbourne. She'd also done a fair bit of work over in Peru, uh, where there was a, um, where they have national simulation programs four times a year, because they have to deal with the uh, threat of, uh, of volcanic disruption. So there's this kind of, um, uh, there's this whole other culture around the world in which simulations uh, become embedded in the practices of society. So Faye gets asked to come to the city of Melbourne through um, uh, to the Arts House team through the city of Melbourne. And she's understanding that this kind of, there's a real difference between the prospect of simulating um, an emergency relief center in an artistic context, which is essentially what the first two years of refuge was, um, and to engaging the community uh, in that, whole practice and she kind of had this nice uh, sort of synergy between um, rehearsal and simulation and she says that the thing about practice that was really terrific for me because of course in the performing arts you rehearse before you go and do something you know you've rehearsed something so when a really major event occurs you're not panicking because you know what to do you've been rehearsing it all your life so simulation is remarkably akin to rehearsal uh, in the performing arts, we iterate until a performance is inscribed, embodied and repeatable. A musician must know where and how her fingers play an instrument to achieve virtuosic precision. An actor learns the position they must occupy, you know, before a light cue is activated. Uh, an operator's got to wait for a change of scenery before cross-fading sound states. These are all learned behaviours within prescribed parameters. And once the basic elements of performance are learned, we simulate. We practice their order in time, calibrating emotions and physicality in order to create and reiterate meaning over the course of a season. In disaster preparedness, simul simulation similarly requires the repetition of protocols and codes to test scenarios, personnel adaptability, and learning speeds in a safe environment. So in real life situations, the potential for actions to endanger lives is pretty high, whereas in a simulation, mistakes can get made and new habits get learned accordingly. So in the first two years of refuge, they turned the North Melbourne Town Hall, which they found out to be a designated emergency relief centre as part of, in, in the city of Melbourne's portfolio, they turned it into a 24 hour uh, emergency relief centre in an emergency setting for flood and fire. And all the participants, all the all the, um, from emergency services, the artists and local community are uh, simulated in a highly, hmm, no, I won't say that, simulated in an artistic framework, uh, what it was gonna be like to be in an emergency relief center. And out of that, a whole set of learnings um, were generated, which I won't go into, I'm, I think I'm coming up close to time. Um, but that is a really great example of the sort of interoperability of um, artistic practice and the practices of emergency services. And so I would propose that there are many other uh, learnings um, for uh, artists and arts workers and cultural operators in sectors outside their own in ways that are not about policy, but in ways that are about behavior, in ways that are granular, in ways that tie us into without giving up any of the intrinsic value of our practices as artists. Thanks. Thank you so much, David. That was fantastic. Could I 
push you for Please, a yeah. question or two to put to the yeah. groups? Yeah, yeah, I do have a question. Yeah, great. Um, okay, so it's a, it's both a, it's one part philosophical and one part practical. Uh, what is the contribution of the arts to the problems surrounding the continuity of our species? Yeah. I did have one other question, which is, operates in a different space, but um, probably we need to answer this one before we can really fully find an answer and maybe a better way to, or a better question for the first one. And that is, how do we listen better? I've, I've put those questions in the chat there. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> that was terrific. And um, Ben has just joined us. You weren't here this morning. What we're going to do now is split into little um, breakout rooms to unpack, respond to those questions for half an hour in smaller groups. And then we come back to report to the big group again. Okay. So, um, Bella, I, I guess we can go to the... Um, the breakouts. Okay, and we're right on right on time as well. It's one o'clock. Shall we see if we can do the the same thing that we did last time of actually uh, hearing a little bit of reportage from the different rooms about what was talked about, um, and then then we can throw back to back to David at the end of it. So the first group, what did you talk about? Well, I've I've got some notes. Um, uh, I'm sure there will be a couple of other contributions because my notes are relatively um, relatively short. We started with a binary, I suppose we, the, the, the idea of a binary anyway, which is both um, the rhetor rhetorical role of the arts in, in bringing the wider sustainability and circular, circular message to the wider society. And then also a, a very simple praxis um, about how can the performing arts be made more sustainable um, in the actual practice um, in terms of distance traveled, both people traveling, but also, uh, you know, props, materials, the material culture of, uh, of the performing arts uh, has often huge uh, distance and, and energy consumption associated with that. Um, the, the, uh, another side, of course, was this ecosystem associated with sponsorship. Um, and I think Joe made a point following on from yours, David, that um, the WA cultural institutions are now all totally dependent on mining funding. Um, and this is beginning to generate a small uh, independent sector that is trying to stay away from that um, that Faustian pact. Um, so one point that has been made to me over the years and, and Creative Partnerships Australia don't e ever put it as crudely as this, that it's just possible that when a mining company wants to become associated with an arts company, it's because uh, an arts company has something that that mining company does not have. And the arts uh, are often in danger of selling themselves short by associating um, or lending their luster in a perfect um, reputational economy cycle. Um, both would be enhanced by the association with one another. It wouldn't be a one-way street and it certainly wouldn't um, be a charitable act of a sponsor to provide uh, support to an arts organization. And the arts, organisa arts organizations really should continue at every opportunity to, to, to think about that as a, as a fundamental to it, its contribution to a broader, more moral, more sustainable planet. Um, so that led us to an, into another strand. Are we really talking about moving towards a poor theatre of, in the Grotowski sense? Um, so we'll just put that out there. Um, 
at the same time as as that poor theatre could, can it, um, strengthen the arts place in the uh, critique of the wider uh, contemporary wasteful city and wasteful spaces? Um, Catherine made uh, a point that I think wouldn't surprise any of us here, that defining the arts by the amounts it earns is a false syllogism. Um, get the art right, the uh, life should follow. Um, but without a national voice um, and the various experiments in national voices, whether it be through the unions or for the visual artists through NAVA, um, in some cases leadership from um, those with money in the cultural practices such as the copyright agency and such as that long tail which I'm going to talk about after lunch a bit um, has failed time and again is that because individual artists are um, stuck in their their individual romantic ideal ideals or the competitive traps that um, people have got into or is there just a genuine uh, dislike of monoliths in our current um, contemporary arts practice. But what Catherine did point out, of course, is that the pandemic has brought the arts back into promise, prominence for individual grassroots people, and it's done it without any money. Indeed, it has done, despite, uh, well, in the face of a pointed refusal of government to provide basic financial support for artists and arts making. Um, so then we got a little back, bit back into the uh, apparently wasteful nature of uh, arts, throwing stuff out at the end of short run productions, um, using enormous amounts of uh, unsustainable power on things. And that some of this is a function of the cost of, of physical space. And that led us into, uh, I think the final thought that part of a sustainable uh, arts practice is to value uh, both the ephemeral nature of, of the artistic performing art, artistic experience, but also to recognise the materiality of the production of art. Uh, and that is not to lose touch with the um, sustainable localised cultural manufacture, which has been destroyed by bean counters and cost cutting um, and, a, and a total erosion of the skills base of costumes, sets, Perukias, you know, you name it, a whole lot of skills have gone out the window. Um, and we are left with the poor theatre, not necessarily as a virtue. So I think that was what I'd got to. I'm sorry if I'm taking up too much time. Is there anyone in the group who'd like to add? Mm. No. Absolutely right. Great. Great. I just wanted to say that, there, in fact, there are three organisations in Perth that are not getting money from the mining companies, one of which is the Western Australian Writers' Centre. So everyone else receives money and is very dependent on it, but not those, not three organisations that have chosen not to accept that money. Not accept money. Right. Uh, shall we press on to group two? Who is group two, Bella? That is David, Pledger, and that's you. Us. That's us. Yeah. What would you like to say, Nicole? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I'm thinking of a number between one and ten. One and ten, and you came up with Nicole. Yep. Um, so we talked. Well, we talked about sustainability from some different angles, and I suppose you know sustainability in terms of ideas we talked about creative people as kind of um and some of the challenges that we face as um you know if we can work through those as exemplars or models for new ways of thinking and working sustainably we also talked about um uh the facility of artists to play with complex ideas and to and to produce work um something concrete we talked about um the contribution of, of artists and the way they work um, in terms of play as a, I suppose, um, as a way of contributing um, skills to other people to sort of enhance sustainability. So to, uh, changing this idea of play, Ian was talking about 
the fact that play has become, you know, leisure, the thing we do after we've sort of done all the work, but looking at how do you bring um, imagination and creativity and play and more playful practices back into all of those structures. Um, in terms of listening, we talked about different ways of listening. Um, is listening part of, Stephen was talking about this idea, is listening part of reflection? Um, uh, David was talking about listening being relative, that depending on who's in the room and, and who, who else is there, we listen and think and articulate ideas very differently. Um, Nick was also talking about, you know, this idea with mining company funding, who are we listening to and how is it then shaping the decisions that we make in our choices? So if we're, um, you know, listening to who's doing the funding and what we should or shouldn't be doing in order to keep, you know, maintain that funding. Um, and, and also, I suppose, a, a little bit the idea of what are we listening for, you know, when we, when we are listening, um, because we talked a lot about the idea of um, in some programming of arts organisations, um, uh, seeing a um, where, where programming might have been very um, subversive or challenging or different that now um, some of those it's, it's quite predictable. And so are we just kind of, you know, um, trying to um, program for um, what audiences say they want to see and hear rather than being more, more challenging. Um, what have I missed? That's pretty good. Is there anything else that I didn't, that we need to put in the mix? No, I think we've got it. No, uh, group three? Who are the, who are the that's us, Max. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to try and do this. <laughs> um, so we started talking off um, about, um, Alison was talking about how there's two ways, uh, um, there's a kind of division between the government and uh, non-government, the people, if you like, um, and what they define as um, um, what, what's, what the priorities are for them. Um, and that the issues of the environment are particularly stamped on the kind of public consciousness at the moment, but, and government will eventually, um, well, actually, ultimately have to listen. Um, and that really what we should do is play, uh, we have to play to that strength. Um, and, um, and Julian then picked up uh, talking about this disjunction uh, that is between um, what we call the, the ruling elite and, and the so-called normal people. Uh, which and asked Larry why that was so, and his view was that it's to do with that part of the cause is to our electoral geography that we have more of a suburban rather than an urban nation, um, and that um, often this means that um, uh, um, that uh, the, and the government can become out of touch with um, its electorate um, because of, because of the kind of um, they're looking at the electoral geography, and one of the reasons that the, the, um, they went to a plebiscite for the gay marriage, for example, was that they, they thought that they would, would win, and in fact, they were proved very wrong on that. Um, and this, um, uh, uh, this, this geography makes us particularly um, vulnerable to party partisanship. Um, Uh, ben talked about this uh, 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 phrase of Fintan O'Toole uh, called Sado populism, um, in which, um, well, he was using the example of Boris Johnson uh, in Brexit. He was saying how, by presenting himself as a, a kind of fool, he's able to harness the big picture tensions um, in the electorate and then kind of, uh, or to secure those, those, those tensions and harness them to his own agenda. And this also is one of these. Um, uh, phenomena that is causing this kind of uh, disjunction. Um, and and a, a similar example that Larry brought up was to do with um, in the, um, the collapse of consensus on the, um, the ETS in 2008 um, with the um, uh, um, that he's saying that they're government had this mistaken assumption that, uh, it, or no, sorry, we on the left had this mistaken assumption that everyone was with us. 
and failed to recognise the tactics of the other side. And that's when we came to this idea of the need, what listening involves is really this, this need to how you listen to the other side. Um, there was concern about whether, or as yes, Keith raised the question of whether um, projects like Refuge um, uh, are kind of converting uh, the art to the kind of utilitarian need, or was this actually uh, producing a new art forms that we could use? Um, uh, and then there's the question of, um, sorry, I'm out. I'm not summarising this very succinctly. Um, and yeah, we moved on to the idea of the, uh, mining and uh, the pressures of sponsorship versus um, the idea of patronage. Uh, um, uh, Alison was saying how we need to, um, well, really, it, it, in the end, it comes down to the need for dialogue. Um, and there was a reluctant consensus that um, uh, it, it, that. In the arts, we're meant to be very good at this, but um, you were meant to be good at empathy, but um, uh, we really, in the end, have to uh, start listening to the, um, learn how to listen to the other side. Um, and um, think about the questions of re reciprocal obligation um, from both sides. Um, That's fine, Harriet. Don't feel like you have to. I'm sorry, it was very rambling. No, no. Listen, it is it is one fifteen, which is lunchtime, and I kind of want to hold us to that schedule. But David, I'm going to give you the right of eighteen second reply. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Just you know, with a whole lot of stuff has sort of been thrown back at you, and you know, in response to your what you offered. Um, Actually, I think it's really important that we don't try to wrap it up, but I do just want to give you a chance just to close out the session. Thanks, Ian. Yeah. yeah very, thanks very much, everybody. Very interesting uh, um, uh, ways of engaging with the question. Very different from all the groups. I, you know, I suppose I'm always going to, uh, whatever I do as a, uh, whether I, I'm curating or writing, it always comes out of an artistic impulse. I'm an artist first, everything folds from that. Um, and so I suppose for me, it becomes down to a question of practice. And I suppose the reason why I asked those two questions, which were, you know, a fair way apart, is that I was curious about the kind of relationship between uh, listening as a practice um, and how that might inform the way in which the arts uh, navigates the terrain of uh, our climates changing and how that threatens the, uh, the natural world. And um, a couple of things have been quite interesting there around, you know, the sort of uh, the, the sort of basic things like the materiality of artistic production, the kind of framing around, you know, how it sits within a, pol within a, a political space. Uh, that idea of you know, Marx, you know, we already in a poor theatre mode, uh, probably are. Uh, but we haven't chosen it, we've been forced into it. I, I've, I've been wondering out loud a few times around this idea that if the listings are very interesting practice to um, try to refine because it covers areas of censorship and privilege as well as the making of art. And I think it's the last part which is, uh, which, you know, I find the greatest hope in is that if our if our the things that we make have largely been commodified and turned into things that must make a profit, one of the uh, things that artists actually have uh, and can remain a hold of is um, their uh, is their method, the way in which they do things, and that is because uh, that is is um, that is that is ephemeral. It's gaseous. You can't concretize it. It changes every single day. It resists so many of the impositions of neoliberalism. It simply seeps, leaks, moves, and uh, to go back to what Stephen said a bit earlier, it can be a binding agent, but it also can kind of uh, be uh, a thing that um, you know, gets into the pores of the skin and changes things in ways that we don't know it. And I guess one of the things I'd like to find out uh, is to how we might draw attention to those in ways that can progress that project forward in a way that doesn't lead to um, uh, just mitigation uh, and in the worst scenarios, devastation. 
Fantastic. Um, let's have a break. Um, we can join back here uh, at 20 past two. Right. Yeah. Give an extra five minutes just to round about so it's a decent hour. Thank you. Thank you, Max. Get away from your desks and go for a walk. Mm -hmm.